I like to think that Alex asked me to preach today because he likes me. But after hearing that text proclaimed, I'm starting to wonder if he has his doubts. This is a hard text for us to hear. It is a hard text for me to preach. But nonetheless, may God add God's blessing to our hearing and receiving of God's word. Will you pray with me? O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strong rock and our redeemer. Amen. The 2003 musical Wicked captivated the heart of Broadway. The story goes that the green Wicked Witch that we saw on the screen of the 1939 motion picture classic The Wizard of Oz wasn't always that bad. Ultimately, she received a bad reputation throughout her life when, in fact, people often treated her less than kindly. Towards the end of the musical, there's a song that's become iconic with the play, The Wicked Witch, or Elphaba, as we have come to know her, and Glinda, the Good Witch, actually become friends for a moment, and you see the fruition of their friendship in the song for good. The song has lyrics such as these. I've heard it said that people come into our lives for a reason, bringing something we must learn, and we are led to those who help us most to grow if we let them and we help them in return. Well, I don't know if I believe that's true, but I know who I am today because I knew you. Like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes the sun, Like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood, who can say if I've been changed for the better? But because I knew you, I have been changed for good. These deeply redemptive lyrics are incredibly spiritual in the light of what we know about the Wicked Witch, but we'll get back to that. Today we hear words from Mark's Gospel, the rich man who comes to Jesus and asks him what he must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus, probably trying not to engage in conversation, just tells him to follow the laws given down to him by his ancestors in the wilderness all those years ago. The young man replies, I've done all that. I go to church, I'm an up-and-standing citizen, I go to Rotary for all intents and purposes, I am the best of the best, the one you want following you and in your kingdom, right? Then Jesus pauses for a second and tells the rich man to sell his 401k, his stocks, his bonds, his possessions, the Mercedes sitting in the front driveway of his second home, and then not only that, but follow this crazy Jewish carpenter from Nazareth on a journey that can't end well. The story goes that the rich man went away grieving, for he had many possessions. My favorite part of this passage isn't that the fact that the 1% of the richest of the rich will get what they want. Um, No, no, that's not my favorite part. They, They have trouble getting that. Nor is my favorite part where Peter tries to rationalize with Jesus. No, my favorite part of this account is when Jesus and the rich man for a split second share a moment. A moment in time. You'll miss it if you're not careful. It's in verse 21. Jesus looking at him, love him. Six simple words. But I think they are profound in the light of the gospel that we hear today and the world in which we live. In 2008, in the height of the Great Recession that plagued our financial world, the United States was also dealing with another issue of sorts, a hotly contested presidential election. One particular candidate, who will remain nameless for the purposes of this sermon, had a campaign slogan that said, change we can believe in. You all remember that. This slogan catapulted this person in the polls because people wanted hope and change, right? Now, I'll leave you to determine if we received the hope or change that we were promised. That's for another day. But I feel that the ideology is something we can look to at the lens of today's gospel narrative. Jesus looks on him and loves him. Jesus knew that for the rich man to enter the fruition of what God had intended for him, he would have to change. 
he would have to change. You see, that's the type of God that the God we serve is. This triune God loves us just the way we are. But God doesn't expect to leave us that way, and he doesn't intend to leave us that way. The entirety of the biblical narrative, from Abraham to to John of Patmos, from Genesis to Revelation, we see that God is not content to leave us where we are. God is all about looking on us and loving us as he did with the rich man, into change, into hope, into transformation. Now to talk about the obvious questions that some of you might have, those of you who are concerned about your bank accounts getting into heaven with you, I know there's some of you there. Was Jesus really against the rich in such a way that would prevent them from getting into God's kingdom? Frederick Buechner puts it in perspective this way. Jesus says that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Maybe the reason it's not that the rich are so wicked that they're kept out of that place, but they're so out of touch with reality they can't see it's a place worth getting into. We're all guilty of it, aren't we? We're all guilty of it. We're all after that elixir of life, that sorcerer's stone that would bring us eternal life here and now. Some of us pursue it through our education, through making a name for ourselves, through medical achievements, through our careers, whatever the case we find that in Jesus, these things don't really matter after all. And that's downright frightening. You see why the rich man went away grieving, for the rich man wanted to run back to his stocks. And we would too if we were asked to leave them behind. We would run back if we were asked to leave our careers behind, our medicines behind, our degrees and our livelihoods behind, if Jesus asked us to. The late, great Peter Gomes, famed preacher at Harvard Memorial Church, puts it this way, We too are very wealthy. And our sadness, like the rich man's, is now that we know what it takes to achieve that ultimate peace and perfection for which we so dearly long, we also know that we are so unwilling to pay the price. What is it that you have to do, that you have to change, but for the life of you, you can't bring yourself to change? Is it giving up the alcohol? Is it laying down the wealth you've accumulated? Is it finally getting help for that mental illness that has plagued you for so long? Ultimately, the questions befitting all of these existential questions is, are you willing to pay the price of change? The rich man wasn't. Are you? Are you any better than the rich man? Can you pay the price of change? But then we see, as we do in Mark's gospel, that Jesus Jesus himself paid the price for change. Jesus risked something big for something good. The biggest thing he could risk and give away, in fact, his life. For the sake that we might change and become creatures of new life, new hope, and redemption. So what Jesus was actually asking was more in depth than giving up everything. It was following him. Will you come and follow me? Will you come and follow me? Knowing that the greatest risk that we take is to change the trajectory of our lives to match the trajectory of his life, we go in our time, in our place, in our context, we go, we change. Are you willing to meet Jesus? Are you willing to lay down your swords and your shields down by the riverside and find new meanings and new possibilities in that change? You see what I love about the slogan, change we can believe in, regardless of the political implications of such, is that it is in fact good news. We as people of faith can believe that in our initiation into the body of Christ and the transformation therein, We are agents of change, not only in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us, right? I haven't addressed the issue that many of you might be wondering. What happens when change doesn't work like it did today? 
what happens when the rich young ruler goes away empty. I love the Sam Wells quote that speaks to the reality of doubt that change can make a difference in our world. Sam writes, Maybe you'll know God's presence every hour, every breath, every touch. But even if not, know that God is with you and God is for you in every moment of this universe's existence. You may believe and trust in the living God, but even if not, the living God lives for you. Even though the rich man went away grieving, Using my scriptural imagination lenses, as we're often called to do, I can't help but think that the grim news for him was still life-changing for us. Even if we don't read it in the scriptures. For anyone who encounters Jesus is changed. Anyone and everyone who encounters Jesus has change they can believe in and change that is worth fighting for. Bishop Will Willimon, one of my professors at Duke University Divinity School, tells the story that one night at a Bible study of college students he was at, he, he told this same story uh, of the rich man and Jesus. He asked his students what they made of this story, of this grim news for the rich man. Had Jesus ever met this man before? Asked one of the students, why do you ask? Bishop Willimon replied, well, because Jesus seems to have a lot of faith in him. He demands something risky and radical of him. I wonder if Jesus knew that this man had a gift for the risky, radical behavior that was required for people to be disciples. I wonder if Jesus knew that this man had a gift or an experience in my experience, a professor only demands the best from students and the professor th th thinks they are the smartest, best students. I wonder what this was about this man that made Jesus have so much faith in him. Another student said thoughtfully, I wish Jesus would ask something like this of me. Bishop Willimon was kind of baffled at that point. This is not the response he was thinking of. The student replied, my parents totally control my life just because they are paying all my bills. And I complain about them calling the shots, but I'm so tied to all this stuff, I don't think I could ever break free, but maybe Jesus thinks otherwise. Friends, that's what Jesus does. That's the good news of the gospel. Jesus turns the news that we thought was bad, whether this was the rich man in Jesus or the cross of Christ. Jesus makes bad news into good news. Jesus tells us to break free and be free. Friends, we have heard the life-changing work of the gospel today. And frankly, the good news is scary to persons like you and me because it demands of us more than we'd ever like to give. But in moments like this, when the road gets rough, when the words proclaimed seemed too lofty or too risky for us to attain, I remind myself that Jesus is a lot like that song from Wicked, like a comet pulled from orbit as it passes the sun, like a stream that meets a boulder halfway through the wood. Who can say if I've been changed for the better that because I knew Jesus, I have been changed for good. Amen. Please turn to our hymn of response, 285, Wherever He Leads I'll Go.
My girlfriend Stephanie and I would like to thank you for your hospitality today. You've been so kind and we're so thankful to be here. Go knowing that God goes with you to change you into the best way possible. That's something we can celebrate. Let us join together in our benediction. Thank you.